My name is uh, Prasanna Santana. I am uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And it's my pleasure to give a brief outline about the you know, state of diabetes care in 2022. So why this is important is we really are facing a huge pandemic slash epidemic of diabetes, which is even bigger than COVID-19. And especially in Southeast Asia and India. And it's very important that we understand the different aspects, uh, diagnosis, management, treatment, prevention of heart disease and so on. So the document that I'm going to go over today is um, a very recent one, 2022. So the care of diabetes has evolved and changed over many years, but we will go through what the current recommendations are based on the American Diabetes Association standards of care guidelines. So the outline of the talk is going to be establishing the diagnosis of diabetes, comprehensive assessment, targets for blood glucose and other risk factors, behavior change interventions, obesity and weight management, medical management of diabetes, cardiovascular disease management, treatment of chronic kidney disease, diabetic eye disease, and neurological complications, prevention and delay of diabetes related complications. And then finally, a uh, summary. So establishing the diagnosis of diabetes. Diabetes is basically classified into two broad categories. You can have other subcategories, but the two broad categories are type one diabetes, that is due to pancreatic insulin producing cell destruction called beta cells. So pancreas has alpha cells, beta cells, and the beta cells produce insulin, but those cells are destroyed due to autoimmunity. That is type one diabetes. That happens in around five to 10% of all cases of diabetes. But the majority of diabetes is type two, which is the epidemic all over the world. Type 2 diabetes is mostly due to resistance to insulin that is caused by progressive deficiency in adequate insulin production. Then there are other kinds of diabetes which are diseases of the pancreas, drug and chemical induced diabetes, and then diabetes in pregnancy, which is the second and third trimester. So this is a good cartoon which gives a overview of the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. So what is happening essentially is when there is decreased insulin secretion due to insulin resistance and decreased beta cell mass and a condition called hyperglucagonemia. Pancreas also produces another, another hormone called glucagon. So when there is an increase in glucagon and destruction of beta cell and reduction of beta cell mass, then there is a condition uh, which is essentially insulin resistance and deficiency. So what it does is it increases circulating fatty acids and causes high blood cholesterol and high fatty acids in the blood. The reason is if you are not able to utilize the glucose that you are consuming due to insulin inefficiency, destruction of beta cell, then the body turns to fatty acids for its energy requirement. And so you have high levels of fatty acids circulating in the blood. Now, when you have insulin resistance, then the glucose is not driven into the muscle. Now, muscle utilizes glucose mainly. This is very important for metabolism. So if muscle is not able to utilize the glucose because of glucose problem, then the blood glucose goes high. The blood glucose uh, can also increase because of increased liver output 
of glucose because the insulin is not working in your liver. And then there is an impaired secretion of incretins, a class of molecules, which we will talk about. There are many new medications that mimic incretin action. So incretins are very important for satiety, that is reducing your appetite, increasing, you know, and um, beta cell mass. Incretin is important for slowing your stomach emptying, which is very important for digestion. So diabetes is also associated with incretin deficiency. So what are the key features of type 2 diabetes in India? So this was a very nice and important paper published in Nature Review by Mohan Clinic in, Ch in Chennai in 2016 which said that, you know, possible etiopathogenesis in type 2 diabetes mellitus in India inquires, uh, in, includes economic prosperity, urbanization, decreased physical activity, high intake of refined cereal, low intake of dietary fiber, fruits and vegetables, um, high waist circumference despite low BMI, high waist to hip ratio, so even though our overall body weight to height square ratio might be lower, we have disproportionately high amount of waist circumference and increased waist to hip ratio. This high amount of waist to hip ratio is associated with increased visceral fat, increased insulin resistance, increased prevalence of cholesterol particles that can go and clog your arteries and cause cardiac problems, heart attacks and strokes, and very early onset of beta cell deficiency. Now, clinical profile of a type 2 diabetes mellitus in India is high incidence and prevalence, occurrence at a very young age, occurrence at a lower BMI, high prevalence of heart disease, relatively lower prevalence of vascular disease, which is uh, poor blood supply to your feet and ankles and, and then probably slightly less prevalence of eye disease and nephropathy compared to the western world but given the size of our population this prevalence um, you know um, is magnified many times in terms of absolute numbers and then there are issues which are low awareness high prevalence of undiagnosed disease unaffordability unavailability of trained medical and paramedical personnel. So continuing on establishing the diagnosis of diabetes, a fasting plasma glucose more than 126 with no calorie intake for at least last eight, last eight hours, a two hour plasma glucose of more than 200 after a glucose tolerance test, which is 75 grams given in water before the test. A1C greater than 6.5%. A1C is a blood test of glycate and hemoglobin. And in a patient with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia, which is increased urination, increased thirst, weight loss, a random plasma glucose of more than 200 is enough to make the diagnosis of diabetes. So who should be screened for type 2 diabetes? Testing should be considered in adults with overweight or obesity in a BMI with a BMI greater than 23 kilograms per meter square. Um, 25 is the cutoff for Caucasian and African American population. 23 is the cutoff for Indians. First degree relative with diabetes. High risk race and ethnicity. So all Indians who are adults should be screened for diabetes. This is an ADA recommendation. Um, history of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, or presently taking medication for high blood pressure, SGL cholesterol less than 35, triglycerides greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter, women with a condition called PCOS, uh, physical inactivity, which is documented like excessive amount of sitting time, 
uh, you know a desktop um, kind of work other clinical conditions associated with insulin resistance it and like this acanthosis which is just darkening of the neck um pigmentation so we don't see that very often but um, something to keep in mind patients with pre diabetes should be tested every year so if your a1c is greater than 5.7 you should test for diabetes every year women diagnosed with pregnancy during any trimester should be tested um for the rest of her life for every um, testing should be done every 3 years for all other patients testing should begin at 35 but in indians it has to be sooner because they are high risk ethnicity and then people with hiv and other rare conditions so decision cycle for patient centric glycemic management this is a very important flow chart and workflow to understand is we have to assess key patient characteristics lifestyle other medical conditions cultural and socio economic context consider specific factors that impact choice of treatment like what should be your a1c goal and target uh, side effect profile of medications complexity of regimen how frequently can you take it accessibility cost um uh and then review and agree on a management plan which should be based upon shared decision making review management plan based on mutual agreement ensure agreed modification of therapy and then this decision should be revisited every 1 to 2 years in terms of shared decision making you are looking at patient preferences motivational interviewing goal setting and um, more empowerment to the patient so that he can make informed choices um ongoing monitoring includes emotional well-being tolerability of medications monitor glycemic status um blood pressure cholesterol and then changes in management every 3 to 6 months if the goals are not met so the key take home here is that smart the goals and management should be very specific to each person the targets should be measurable they should be achievable they should be realistic and they should be time limited um cannot be open ended so smart is the mantra so comprehensive assessments for diabetes first you need to have a detailed medical history uh behavioral factors um behavioral factors includes you know um different other psychological issues mental health conditions social life does the person live alone is he married does he have social support technological competence i mean we right now have enormous amount of technology at our disposal for uh, diabetes care like smartphone apps continuous glucose monitors um Uh, remote calibration and measurement of blood glucose um ai based algorithms to to adjust insulin so we have to assess how technologically competent the person is medications and vaccinations uh physical examination um these are all provided by a diabetes care provider laboratory tests and uh, those uh, are the complete um, set of you know um aspects of comprehensive assessment low blood glucose re- risk so factors that increase risk of treatment associated hypoglycemia which is always a concern in the elderly population uh, and uh, people with brittle diabetes is insulin use or medications that release insulin impaired kidney or liver function longer duration of diabetes frailty and old age cognitive impairment which is um unable um, if the person is unable to function at his full mental capacity impaired counter regulatory response which is hypoglycemia unawareness um the person is not able to recognize when his sugars go low and he suddenly becomes unconscious so he is not able to recognize hypoglycemia physical or intellectual disability that may impair behavior response to hypoglycemia alcohol use 
polypharmacy, which implies multiple other medications if the person is taking concomitantly, then that increases the risk of hypoglycemia. History of a severe hypoglycemic event. All these put your um, put the person under increased risk of low blood glucose. So next, looking at the treatment goals, healthy older adults with few coexisting chronic illnesses and intact cognitive function and functional status should have a target of A1C less than 7 to 7.5%. Those with multiple coexisting chronic conditions, mental health problems, cognitive impairment, dementia or functional dependence. Um, they are not able to live alone, um, uh, are functionally dependent on others, should target an A1C less than 8%. Uh, blood glucose goals for some older adults should be relaxed as part of individualized care. But symptoms of um, or risk of acute hyperglycemia should be avoided. Screening for diabetes complications should be individualized in older adults. Particular attention should be paid to complications that will lead to functional impairment. Treatment of hypertension to individualized target is also indicated. The key take home here is that the goal of A1C is individualized based on different aspects of the person's health and well being. We cannot have a carpet. Uh, level of A1C reduction or a unique or a uniform goal for everybody. Treatment of other cardiovascular risk factors should be individualized in older adults considering the time frame of benefit. Lipid lowering therapy and aspirin therapy may benefit those with life expectancies at least equal to the time frame of the clinical trial. So a person should be expected to live at least for five to 10 years when we are aggressively manage, managing diabetes related complications since the trials have been done for that time frame. Beyond that, it will be an extrapolation of results in, and in statistical terms, we just don't know. So this is very important. We have to consider the overall life expectancy of the person. Um, behavioral change and nutrition therapy goals to promote and support healthful, healthy full eating patterns, uh, emphasizing a variety of nutrient dense foods in appropriate portion sizes to improve overall health and achieve and maintain body weight goals. Attain individualized glycemic blood pressure and lipid goals that I just spoke about to address individual nutrition needs based on personal and cultural preferences, to maintain the pleasure of eating by providing non-judgmental messages about food choices, to limit food choices only when indicated by scientific evidence, to provide an individual with diabetes, the practical tools for developing healthy eating patterns. So many important take homes here. First, many people are vegetarians, some are non-vegetarians, uh, some, have, uh, some have other eating habits. So we should try and provide nutrition based on their culture and personal preferences. The key is to make non-judgmental um, decisions and providing the right message to the patient um, so that we, we encourage them to gradually transition towards a healthy eating. Food choices should only be limited by what is proven in science. There are many theories about different herbs and herbal preparations which are floating around, um, you know, Ayurvedic products, but we should wait and assess them for scientific evidence and only recommend choices that are indicated by scientific evidence. And um, each, each individual should use practical tools like smartphone apps, you know, um, website information that are reliable to develop healthy uh, to develop uh, healthy eating patterns. So behavioral change uh, interventions, carbohydrates, nutrient dense carbohydrate sources that are high in fiber 
at least 14 grams fiber per 1000 kilocalories um, uh, and minimally processed should be consumed. Eating plants should include non-starchy vegetables, fruits and whole grains, as well as dairy products with minimal added sugars. People with diabetes and those at risk are advised to replace sugar sweetening beverages, including fruit juices with water as much as possible. When using an insulin therapy program, education on the glycemic impact of carbohydrate, fat and protein should be tailored to an individual's needs and preferences and used to optimize mealtime dosing. For example, if you are consuming a high glycemic, which is high carbohydrate source, then it will be rapidly absorbed, but the insulin may act a few minutes later. So there might be a risk of dropping sugar and uh, very high sugar initially. So we have to make sure that the timing of the food and insulin is um, adjusted based on the actual um, composition of food itself, which is the proportion of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Dietary fat. An eating plan emphasizing elements of a Mediterranean-style eating pattern rich in monounsaturates and polyunsaturated fats is advised. Eating foods rich in long-chain fatty acids, such as fatty fish uh, and nuts and seeds is recommended. Alcohol intake should be in moderation. Sodium intake should be less than 2,300 milligrams per day. Non-nutritive sweeteners are okay, like say Diet Coke, um, artificial sweeteners, Splenda, as long as there is no compensatory increase in other ingredients. Protein intake is not restricted, but it may cause low blood glucose in people taking insulin if there are no adequate carbohydrates. So you should take carbohydrates if you are taking some form of insulin. Obesity and weight management. A 5% weight loss is recommended for persons with type 2 diabetes. Additional weight loss also results in greater benefit. High frequency of counseling, dietary changes, physical activity and variable therapy to achieve a 500 to 750 kilogram calorie per day energy deficit. And individualized preferences are important considerations. Behavioral changes that create an energy deficit, regardless of macronutrient composition, will result in weight loss. Evaluate systemic, structural, and socioeconomic factors that may impact dietary patterns. For those who achieve weight loss goals, long-term weight management programs are recommended when available. Such programs should provide body weight measurements and self-monitoring strategies and encourage regular physical activity, 200 to 300 minutes per week. The main thing is the 200 per 300 minutes per week does not have to be consecutive. It can be cumulative, which means that you can do 15 minutes three times a day, seven days a week, and you can achieve almost or even more than 300 minutes per week. Short-term dietary intervention using structured, very low-calorie diets, 800 to 1,000 kilocalories, should be prescribed for very selective individuals who have very high BMI and want, and want to rapidly lose weight. Long-term comprehensive weight management strategies and counseling should be integrated to ma maintain weight loss. I'm sorry, uh, obesity and weight management. Um, diet, physical activity, behavioral counseling, pharmacotherapy and metabolic surgery um, are recommended if BMI is between 25 to 26.9, uh, diet and physical activity and behavioral counseling. 27 to 29.9, you require both diet, physical activity, behavioral counseling and pharmacotherapy. If weight is greater than 30, then diet, pharmacotherapy, and metabolic surgery, all three are recommended. When choosing glucose-lowering medications, consider the medication's effect on weight loss. Whenever possible, minimize medications for comorbid conditions that are associated with weight gain. Weight loss medications are effective as adjuncts to diet, physical activity, and behavioral counseling for selected people with type 2 diabetes and BMI greater than 27. 
if a patient's response to weight loss medication is effective, further weight loss is likely to occur with continued use. When early response is insufficient, or if there are significant safety or intolerability, uh, then consider discontinuation of the medication. So this is a very nice uh, flow chart that shows you how treatment of diabetes is individualized based upon other cofactors and issues. So the first line therapy of comorbidities uh, depends upon patient-centric treatment factors, cost and access considerations, management needs, and include generally includes metformin the main drug which is used for diabetes. ASCVD indicators of high risk. If you have heart failure and chronic kidney disease, then recommend independently or baseline A1C, individualized A1C target or metformin use. And then if you have heart failure, then you use a certain class of medications called SGLT2 with proven benefit. If you have chronic kidney disease, um, say with albuminuria and or without albuminuria, then you can use either SGLT2 or GLP-1 class of agents. If you have high risk cardiovascular disease indicators, then we use GLP-1 or SGLT2. And if his A1C is more than target, above target, then we use uh, other agents. And say, and then incorporate agents that provide adequate efficacy to achieve and maintain glycemic goals. Higher glycemic uh, efficacy therapy, including GLP-1, insulin, carbohydrates, are all based upon the person's need to minimize hypoglycemia, minimize weight gain and promote weight loss, and consider cause and access. So the key thing here is that all agents are highly tailor-made based on the person's target uh, insulin, uh, target A1C, um, the need to lose weight, the need to minimize hypoglycemia, the cost for the patient, and the presence of other comorbidities like CKD, heart failure, and uh, heart, heart disease. So this is a nice table which gives you an overview of the entire armamentarium of diabetes medications and its other effects other than lowering A1C. So you see most of the current agents that are used for oral intake do not cause low blood sugars in most cases. Some might cause weight loss, especially SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1. Some are weight neutral and others might actually cause weight gain. So a person who has very lean um, body habitus with low BMI and still has diabetes type 2, he might actually benefit when, from a certain amount of weight gain. So these agents might be used in those patients. So if you have a heart failure, then there is benefit in using SGLT2. Um, but some medications like thiazolidine dions, Actos, Avandia, they may actually increase the risk of heart failure. If you have ASCVDA, that is cardiovascular disease, metformin might benefit but SGLT2 are definitely beneficial. GLP-1 are of great benefit. DPP-4 are neutral. And then thiazolidine dions and sulfonylureas are kind of um, on the neutral. Medical management. Priority one is for agents that have low chance of low blood glucose while lowering the risk of heart and kidney disease. Priority two for agents that have low chance of low blood glucose and decreased body weight. So the first aim in diabetes management is to lower the risk of heart and kidney disease. The point here is that ADA is moving away from looking at numbers per se and looking more at the actual outcomes. Blood glucose numbers are important, a good number of A1C and target A1C is good, but what is the risk of the person developing heart disease or diabetes or stroke or dying sooner is what most physicians 
are interested today. They want to lower the risk of complications. And second, they want to lower body weight because that can feed into more medication requirement. So cardiovascular disease risk. So there is a risk scoring system which has been employed by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. It you know, estimates a 10-year risk of an individual, individual's first cardiac event. Um, you know, you click this website and you plug in a set of numbers and you will see what is your risk for cardiac disease. Now, the one problem in this is that it might not have been validated for all ethnicities and uh, populations, um, but um, studies are ongoing to uh, validate it in different ethnicities and population um, um, so that we have meaningful uh, assessments of cardiovascular risk. High blood pressure uh, for individuals with diabetes and hypertension and uh, higher cardiovascular disease, um, a blood pressure target of less than 130 over 80. Uh, for individuals with diabetes and hypertension at lower risk for cardiovascular disease, treat to a blood pressure target of less than 140 over 90. In patients with diabetes at higher risk, especially with those with multiple risk factors, or aged 50 to 70 years, then we need to treat them with high intensity statin therapy. In adults with diabetes and 10 year cardiovascular risk of 20% or higher, add other agents like estomib to maximum tolerated statin to lower LDL of less than 50%. Chronic kidney disease prevention. Urinary albumin and EGFR should be assessed in all patients with type two diabetes regardless of treatment every year. Patients with diabetes and albumin, um, with urinary albumin greater than two, 300 milligrams per grams uh, or an EGFR between 30 to 60 should be monitored twice annually. Blood glucose control is vital for CKD prevention. For patients with type two diabetes and diabetes related kidney disease with an EGFR greater than 20, and urinary albumin greater than 300, we use a class of medication called SGLT2 that I already spoke about, and um, they are of immense benefit. Optimization of blood glucose, blood pressure control, and reduction in blood pressure variability to reduce the risk or slow the progression of CKD is recommended using an ACE inhibitor or R. Patients should be referred to nephrologists if they have an EGFR less than 30. CKD disease management. For patients with non-dialysis dependent stage 3 or higher CKD, dietary protein intake should be a maximum of 0.8 grams per kilograms of body weight per day. Diabetic eye disease. Blood glucose control is important. Control of cholesterol and BP is also very important. An eye exam is recommended by an ophthalmologist that is comprehensive at the time of initial diagnosis annual examination every one to two years, then onwards um, depends upon the state of the eye. Refer to ophthalmologists for any level of macular edema or if proliferative or non-proliferative retinopathy is diagnosed. Pan-retinal laser photocoagulation is done in the case of proliferative and severe non-proliferative retinopathy to avoid vision loss. Intravitreous injections of antivascular endothelial growth factors sometimes performed for the cases of proliferative retinopathy. Intravitreous injections of antivascular endothelial growth factor is indicated to treat severe diabetic macular edema. Grid photoagulation and other intravenous, intravitreous steroids are sometimes given for this purpose. The presence of retinopathy is not a contraindication for aspirin therapy. This is something very important to keep in mind. So I'll show you a picture of DM macular edema. So DM uh, macular edema commonly involves microaneurysms, exudates, and cystic intraretinal fluid. You can see here that in the center of this image, there is this swelling and small little spots uh, of cystic uh, fluid. That is, uh, this is a very nice picture of diabetes macular edema. So as the macular edema grows, there is more fluid accumulation. Um, increased in your retina and you are not able to see 
properly with blurred causing blurred vision diminished vision this is non proliferative diabetic retinopathy severe non proliferative diagnostic uh, um, uh, you know diabetic retinopathy showing cotton wool exudates you see all these spots looking like cotton um and then there are hemorrhages all over so this is when your diabetic eye disease goes so bad that there is bleeding inside and cotton wool spots diabetic neuropathy all patients should be assessed for diabetic peripheral neuropathy after initial diagnosis you should check by using typically a temperature or a vibration or a pin prick sensation um annual 10 grams monofilament testing to identify feet at risk for ulceration and amputation symptoms and signs of autonomic neuropathy should be evaluated in patients with microvascular complications diabetes foot care comprehensive annual feet exam including testing for neuropathy and feet inspection assessment of pulsations in the feet sometimes we do a thing called ankle brachial index assess for deformities um cardiovascular disease and smoking is associated with a higher risk of peripheral vascular disease so this is a picture of a diabetic foot ulcer so you see when diabetes goes out of control there are, there can be severe you know loss of uh, intact skin this in loss of intact skin is a superficial grade 1 ulcer but then grade 2 here on the right side close to the bigger toe is a deep ulcer and maybe grade 2 grade 3 ulcer because there might be bone involvement and we don't have a picture of gangrene here but the point is that if diabetes goes really uncontrolled for a long period of time you are at risk for developing these kind of feet problems which can be very severe very debilitating mm-hmm. and very discomfort prevention or delay of type 2 diabetes persons with weight gain should try and achieve a 7% loss of initial body weight and increase moderate intensity physical activity to at least 150 minutes to 300 minutes per week change in eating patterns technology assisted programs might be very helpful like website support groups and apps so i'm coming to the summary slide um diabetes treatment is not one size fits all we have to individualize the goals of treatment avoiding low blood sugar is sometimes more important than controlling high blood glucose blood glucose levels are just numbers we are more interested in prevention of heart kidney eye and nerve disease healthy eating choices and stress free life are as important for diabetes management as our medications and this is the last um, you know cartoon what is more evil darth vader joker frankenstein sugar fat or carbs and i conclude my presentation here so i will go over some of the questions in the chat box okay uh sivram krishnan says okay uh, that's something to okay you have already taken in your slides fasting 126 and pp 200 in india it is still 80 to 80 and 120 to 180 is this a shift which we are aware in western world or we can we take it universally so uh, mr sivram krishnan ada says that fasting more than 126 and pp more than 200 is diabetes fasting between 100 to 126 is pre diabetes and uh, between 140 to 200 is pre diabetes in post prandial but then you sometimes you may have one of them abnormal and the other one might be normal in that case we have to establish it during do, by doing a glucose tolerance test so if you have one abnormality say your fasting is 110 but your pp is greater than 220 um uh, then you might still have diabetes so you have to confirm it by repeated testing you mentioned that there are multiple reasons causes of type 2 diabetes can the medications and care be tailor made for each case for example if once type 2 diabetes is mainly due to increased in deficiency will some medications work better than others 
So we do not test for specific kinds of diabetes. What we do is we know from your A1C and C peptide and pro insulin, insulin measurements, and uh, you know, some antibody measurements like glutamic acid decarb decarboxylase, GAD, which is all you know, um, complex antibodies. When we test for them and those antibodies are negative and your C peptide is detectable, we assume mostly that it's type 2 diabetes. Whether type 2 diabetes is specifically due to a particular incretin deficiency, we don't know. Research has, uh, is not there yet. But we do know that if you have worsening type 2 diabetes, then you develop definitely develop incretin deficiency later on. So incretin deficiency um, uh, and incretins can be used to treat analogs, can be used to treat diabetes. Is there any way to determine the cause of type 2 diabetes in a person such as incretin deficiency? So yes, this is a metabolic disorder where all the things are involved simultaneously or at multiple levels. So which came first and which came second is very hard to establish. So that is a very important aspect. Did um, incretin deficiency occur before insulin deficiency or resistance? This is something you have to test someone repeatedly in the lab and do some uh, high level imaging as well as uh, biochemical testing which is not practically feasible in everybody. Is there a progress on reversing type 2 diabetes? So diabetes can be reversed in certain situations. If you are having a very high BMI of say 35 or 40 and you lose like 20% um, or 25% of your weight, then diabetes can be reversed. Sometimes PP value is lower than fasting sugar. Does it mean we can take more sugar in the morning? No, that is not um, the interpretation. The uh, laboratory values um, can change, can fluctuate. Uh, people who have a lower PP value means that they have a good response to insulin when they eat food. But when, they, when higher fasting sugar is there, it means that they are producing more glucose overnight, um, you know, from their liver. So that is very important to understand. So we have to treat both glucose output from the liver as well as um, moderate the carbohydrate intake so that the PP doesn't go high. Is there any truth in rounds doing the uh, about med the medical fraternity progressively lowering the threshold for being declared a diabetic for business reasons rather than genuine uh, reasons. So why is diabetes diagnosed when blood glucose is more than 126? The reason is there was a study done in Pima Indians, which is a group of um, community somewhere in Philippines, where they saw that if blood glucose goes more than 126, you suddenly have a drastic increase in the risk of eye disease and the curve starts to shoot up. So there is an inflection point. So what is that inflection point is a subject of debate, but many people say that 126 is a fairly reasonable inflection point when your eye disease starts to shoot up. Now we do know that between 100 and 126, if you have blood glucose, your risk of cardiovascular disease is more than a person whose blood glucose is less than 100. So the point here is that it is a continuum. It is not quantized. It is a continuum. So when there is a continuum, we just look at the epidemiology and disease burden and then decide on cutoffs. I don't think there is any business reason here, I'm not aware of at least. Is there evidence in benefit for intermittent fasting in pre-diabetes? Fasting is always beneficial. So there's no doubt there are some studies that support intermittent fasting and um, not proven in long-term trials, but definitely there are many studies that show intermittent fasting can be beneficial.
A1C is 7.5. I think you should consult your doctor, Mr. Kishore. Um, this presentation is meant for medical con conference and not for patient-centric. Well, I agree. I mean, uh, I try to um, keep it very simple in the context of, uh, uh, you know, um, diabetes, but with a more educated kind of presentation. Consumption of fenugreek in an empty stomach helps control sugar level. Is this true? Um, there are no studies to that effect. So honestly, I can't comment on that. If there are any scientific studies, I can say. Isn't type 2 uh, also lack of insulin production? Um, yes, when type 2 goes for many, many years, you can have um, insulin deficiency and pancreatic burnout and the persons may um, require insulin. Most cases of type 2 diabetes are not due to not having enough insulin, but due to insulin not being effective due to insulin resistance. That's correct. Lots of medical uh, um, terminology. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I try to keep it simple. Are the diabetic reversal programs realistic in terms of success rates? As I spoke about, diabetes has been reversed only in very um, high degree of obesity. I think there are many questions that are coming continuously. Um, I don't know when to kind of um, call it quits. Any suggestions from anybody? Insulin is a fat storage hormone. So promoting weight loss shouldn't be, shouldn't we practice intermittent fasting and reduce carbs and get the energy from fat? Uh, please share your thoughts. This is a subject of very active research. So I will say till people figure this out truly, um, we will have to wait. Does fructose and glucose have similar effect on diabetic person? Excellent question. Natural fructose has a lesser effect than high fructose, which is very bad. It can rapidly increase your glucose through what we call a process, um, rapid metabolism in the body. Mm, high carbohydrate, uh, high concentrated glucose is as bad as high concentrated fructose, but uh, fruit fructose, which is mild, can be better. Can we use Splenda for long periods? Yes, but Splenda can also cause some metabolic changes. But yes, we can use Splenda so far as a glucose substitute. Do you have a table for food converts to blood sugar? Uh, yeah, it's web, uh, you know, um, available in many, many websites. Apollo Hospital has conducted studies on fenugreek consumption and they confirm that it is true fenugreek um, control sugar levels. Very good. I mean, I will be interested to look at that study. Uh, please comment on HOMA markers. Okay, so HOMA is homeostatic model of insulin resistance. Actually, I have published a couple of paper looking at, papers looking at body composition and insulin resistance through HOMA. So HOMA is a complex mechanism where you actually, um, in a homeostatic model, what you do is we infuse glucose and we continuously measure insulin secretion in the blood and use an algorithm to see their um, quantification of insulin resistance. HOMA is not used right now to monitor or treat diabetes, but it's um, being used a lot of in a lot of research in animal models. Is eating fruits harmful? Low glycemic fruits are not um, that harmful, but uh, like papaya and high glycemic foods like sapota, bananas can raise your blood sugar. Okay, how to treat type one? Uh, well, it's an expert question. Already my presentation has been more technical than many people wanted. So I would say, you know, consult your doctor. It's treated by insulin. Artificial sweetness um, can be used if a person is, uh, 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 you know, uh, wants to eat something sweet. Um, but at the same time, one sugar, sugar, yes. You're missing my question on pH balancing. Piece of his type to control. I didn't get that. 
pH balancing in what context? Uh, let me see. Body pH balance. So body pH regulates automatically on its own. Your body's pH is maintained in a very, very narrow range by kidney, by your lung. So I don't think that has much to do with diabetes, except that if your kidneys and um, body fails, then you will become acidotic. And if you're producing too much fatty acid from the liver, um, then you will become acidotic and you go into a condition called DKA. Does acid food affect CKD? Acid food can cause a lot of gastritis, but I don't think they're directly related to CKD itself. How about dairy consumption? Healthy or unhealthy? Anything in moderation, in limitation is good for, um, you know, it's okay. As long as you're not overdoing it. Okay, so here I will pause and uh, thank you very much.